What's up, party people? This episode of the podcast is brought to you by Promises Behavioral Health. Promises is a family of mental health and addiction treatment centers based out of Nashville, Tennessee, and they're ready to help you or your loved ones stay committed and achieve your promise of recovery. Now, I've personally worked with many team, uh, team members at Promises. They're great people. They care. Many of them have family and friends that are in recovery, so they get it. And uh, more importantly, they also have highly trained staff members throughout a variety of treatment centers. Now, here's what you can do. If you got some questions about yourself, your own situation, about your loved one, uh, you can reach out to them. Go to promisesbehavioralhealth.com slash sober guy. Uh, they created a great web page over there. Check it out. Plenty of resources on there. Or you can just call 888-205-1890. Uh, tell them that you heard about them from that Sober Guy podcast. Uh, let me give you that number one more time. It's 888-205-1890. Big thanks to Promises and hope uh, them and the team out in Tennessee and all the areas are doing well. Um, let me provide you with a few resources and then we're going to get to our guest today. Um, online daily AA meetings via Zoom every night at 6 p.m. nine uh, 6 p.m. Pacific, 9 p.m. Eastern. And uh, here's what you can do. You can go to www.zoomaaemails.com. Uh, many of you have heard my sponsor, Buddy C, on the podcast. Uh, he heads up this meeting, and I was in it last night, and there was uh, 40 or 50 people in there from all over the place uh, staying connected, uh, staying plugged in, talking, going over step work. Um, so it's really a great, safe place that you can jump into. There was a couple new people last night. Uh, so once again, just let me give you that uh, that uh, address one more time. It's www.zoomaaemails.com. And uh, you can jump in and check that out there. And then also uh, Promises has rooted. Uh, uh, my buddy Patrick from Promises heads, heads this meeting up. It's offered weekly online through virtual meetings in the Zoom platform. Uh, the meetings are welcome to all people in all forms of recovery, no matter what you're recovering from or what brought you to recovery. Uh, you can go to promisesbehavioralhealth.com slash rooted uh, and you can get the calendar to see what meeting works for you. I wanted to give a, a quick couple of shout outs here. Thanks to John from White Plains, New York. Congrats on three years sober. Um, thanks to Nicholas from Atlanta for the email. Congrats on 77 days sober. Uh, big thanks to Josh who hit me up on Instagram. He has three days sober, man. Keep it up. Just hang in there. Stay plugged in. Uh, also, Anthony for reaching out on Instagram. I uh, said he's struggling to stay sober, but putting some things together. We gave him some resources and hopefully you're staying plugged in there. And then last but not least, Daniel, man, who recently hit 11 months. Big congrats to all you guys. Stay plugged in. Keep showing up. God will do the rest. Uh, I know for me and my own experience, that's the way it's worked and he's never let me down. So um, keep, keep at it, guys. All right, let's get this uh, show on the road. We got my buddy Evan Haynes joining today and we're going to get to him in just a second. That Sober Guy podcast contains adult content, merciless truth, and emotional nudity. Listener discretion is advised. I'm Shane Raymer. You're listening to That Sober Guy podcast. And we help people stay sober. I just took a drink right there. Woo. Be sure to check us out at thatsoberguy.com. And uh, you can connect with us on Instagram, at Real That Sober Guy, and on Twitter, at Shane Raymer. Uh, real quick, we have some new California-style hoodies, tanks, T-shirts that are out. Go to www.thatsoberguy.com uh, slash merch. Uh, you can also check them out at Real That Sober Guy on Instagram. Pick those up there. All right, so we have uh, my buddy Evan Haynes. He's the co-founder of Allo House Recovery Centers. Um, and uh, he's going to join the podcast today, talk to us a little bit about what's going on today, what's going on with Allo House, and uh, share a little bit about his story. Uh, Evan, how are you, man? Thanks for coming on the podcast today. Good. Thank you, Shane. Thanks for having me. You know, it's good to be here. It's good to be anywhere right now and any form of human contact that I'm starved <laughs> for. It. So yeah. this is especially exciting uh, today, and I really do appreciate you having me. Yeah, so you're you're based down in uh, the Los Angeles area. Uh, did you grow up down there? Where are you from originally? I'm actually from Canada, Got and I uh, grew up in Vancouver, Canada, and I moved down here about 15 years ago, Got mostly it. to do with the weather. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and what's interesting, so the, the, there, there's we're we're a very similar country, Canada, um, but there are these kind of key differences. I mean, we're probably way too nice. I mean, that's. Uh, <laughs> something I think I get all the time. We, our favorite second word probably is sorry. Sorry, sorry. Sorry. <laughs> uh, someone, someone bumps into us, we'll say sorry. And, um, but also I think that the, the drinking in particular, which was my kind of primary vice, yeah. uh, it's, it's normal. It's part of the culture. And I didn't know 
until I move down here that it isn't normal to, you know, drink yourself into a blackout, drive mm. around with, you know, a baseball bat and a can of bear mace in your car <laughs> looking for fights. Wow. And uh, so I thank America, which, believe it or not, is a little more uh, civilized than than even Canada when it comes to sort of controlling yourself yeah. uh, around drinking. <laughs> now, now bear, now bear mace would make sense in, in Canada, in your area. Is that, would that be right? Or was bear mace just a specific tool that you thought, hell, I might be able to use yeah. it. One day. <laughs> I mean, you have it, you have it because of the possible bear in Canada. Yeah. And, and, yeah. and I've had a number, I mean, starting as a, a young child, I mean, I've had a number of close encounters with bears. So yeah, you want to kind of have it nearby just yeah. in case. And then of course it can double for some kind of, uh, I've been, maced so i got sober november 2nd 2005 and um i found a lot of peace immediately uh and then other peace came more slowly and i i still had uh, uh i guess some anger management issues I, mm. I remember when i first got sober i was like i just want to find out why i'm so angry yeah and uh you know they didn't like disappear instantly and, and i think the step work helped a lot helped a lot with that but I was in a road rage incident, you know, maybe a year sober or something. And um, I was brake checking some guy who was honking behind me. And we stopped, got out of my car, walked over to see what his problem was. And all I saw was his arm stick out with this can of something and this yellow liquid in slow motion just filling my eyeballs. And I'd been maced once before, so I knew... I was either spray painted with some yellow paint or I was just maced and yeah. I probably had maybe 30, maybe 30 seconds to get my car out of the intersection. Um, and I opted to do that and uh, jumped in my car, drove it off onto a side street, went into a restaurant, asked where the bathroom was, hear the guy coughing. <laughs> it's just down. Yeah. He's coughing because I've got mace all over me. I'm trying to rinse <laughs> it off. It's spreading it all over my body. Um, you know, and of course I went to find out what his problem was and it turned out that the problem was mine. Oh man. Yeah. Dang. So I'm getting some sort of clicking noise that's coming. Oh. I, I'm not sure if it's hitting my, on, it may be hitting on a button or something but there. I can hold it up like that. Uh, okay. That better? There you go. That's better, but I don't want you have to hold it like that the whole interview. I don't mind. Yeah. Okay. Whatever you got to yeah. do. <laughs> so, so you actually got maced. Like oh, yeah. you, what did that like? So in, in, uh, I've never been maced before. I have a couple of buddies who are police officers, so they go through some training and they've talked about it before and they, they've been tased and stuff too. But I would imagine that does not feel good. How long does it take to get that out of your eyes? At least half an hour. You know, and again, I was pouring water on my head after that oh. I was just spreading it down my body. Uh, it, and then you go kind of almost into convulsions. It hurts so much. Yeah. And yeah, people have had heart attacks. So that was my third time being maced. <laughs> so if I go so, back. So Evan, you've been maced three times. <laughs> three times. So if I go back. The first time was the Stanley Cup riots in Vancouver, which I believe were in, oh, I want to say, 94 or 97. That sounds fun. It was 94. The Stanley so Cup the, riots. The Canucks almost won, but then they lost. And we're watching the news, my buddies and I, and we see oh, everyone's going downtown and basically rioting. We're like, well, let's go check it out, yeah. of course. And everyone was kind of marching down this one street in one direction. So we thought, well, let's go the other direction and sort of see what, what's going on. And you get to the end of this crowd and there's a line of riot police kind of chasing them, marching them down the street. And, and just all of a sudden they all start firing, I guess, canisters of tear gas. And oh man. The second one was I think 1999 or 2000. There was the uh, APEC conference, which was like the Asia Pacific economic uh, conference or something Mm -hmm. at my university, University of British Columbia. And I guess mostly people were protesting uh, a guy named Suharto, who was the president of Indonesia at the time. And when we were growing up, we knew that the people of East Timor, um, there was a genocide being carried out against them by this guy Suharto. And here we were inviting him (laughs) to our college campus. Yeah. You know, like it's no big deal. And so we weren't, happy about that and i got uh tear gassed that time so 
You have some experience, times. some experience being maced here, guest. I'm assuming all intoxicated, might I add. Would that be the uh, case well, or most of the time at least? First to- time for sure. The second time I was intoxicated by, you know, a, a, a deep sense of injustice, which I'm still mm. slightly intoxicated by. Sure. Um, what's funny is by the third time, uh, you know, just after getting sober, I had um, become so... Um, not interested in the sort of uh, crimes against humanity, the environment, things I'm actually, I've, I've, I've rekindled my passion in yeah. things I would fight for today, maybe differently. And, and then maybe in a more dispassionate way, I, I don't know. Uh, I think we kind of mellow in our, in our old age, but um, yeah. I'd stopped caring about everything at that point. Yeah. That's for sure. So what if you can take us back like what was what was a normal day in Evan's life like like when you were at the at the peak like just in the addiction in the alcoholism like what did, what did a normal day look like or or you know Well somehow I mean I'm I kind of defy certain certain odds um and again I wouldn't recommend this at home for for, for anyone but I was uh, definitely kind of a, a a recluse a loner and while I was in college I smoked a lot of weed and I would take ephedrine pills mm. at, all day to do my, I, I didn't know college was about partying actually at that time. So I would get my assignment. I'd go to the library, get the books, go home and start writing like a term paper. Yeah. Smoke weed all day long, take handfuls of these ephedrine pills, which are like, I guess before Adderall, you know, there's, um, Ephedrine. It's, I, it's I remember those. Stimulant. They had they had these pills that came out, and they were called yellow jackets, and they were yeah. like full of that shit. And you could yeah. you could take them, and same thing. You, I mean, they just made you kind of wire, but they were legal. You could buy them like at a liquor store or whatever. Hundred percent. Are these? I think at the time in Canada, you could get in a health food store, yeah. but you can like oh. feel the back of your head's tingling, oh, and man. you're just like alive. And yeah. I would get all this work done, and then at night drink a couple bottles of wine and. You know, it's funny, the more weed I smoked, the better I did in college. Again, this is not, I don't think. I know a couple people like that. It's okay. (laughs) Yep. I just don't get it too. Yeah. Then I got into like grad school and I did the coursework and then I was supposed to write a thesis. So the grad program was two years long. I think around year six, someone wrote me like, is there not a statute of limitations? I, I just, just curious. And I hadn't occurred to me. So I called the school. I'm like, Hey, is there a statute of limitations? Like, when am I supposed to finish my thesis by? Yeah. And I go, Oh, you know, we're about to, to like expel you. You can't, this is a two year program. <laughs> and I was like, Oh my God. And I got, I think I got a letter from a doctor quickly, like finish this stupid thesis. But yeah. Um, for me, it was, you know, I would go out uh, in Hollywood. So coming to LA, like I said, it, it, I blossomed, I guess, into this alcoholic. I didn't realize I was. when did you come to LA? And, you know, what, what's our, what's that? When did you come to LA? Uh, like 2000, 2003, 2004. Okay. And you were so, out of college. Yeah, I was were, here for a couple of years. Okay. Got it. And, and so, you know, I liked to go out and get very drunk, get into a blackout, try to fight people, uh, crash my car, which I did a, a few times uh, with usually parked cars or something like that. But, um, Finally, what happened in uh, late October 2005 is uh, I was in a blackout driving my car and I crashed it into a car with a person in it. And I mean, thank God she was all right. I I could have killed somebody that night. And I came to in handcuffs on the curb on Sunset Boulevard. And uh, I went to L.A. County Jail. I was there for a few days. And, um, you know, I thought they must have made some terrible mistake. I remember telling my cell mate, this street kid got arrested in Venice like the night before at a Starbucks drunk and disorderly. And I told him like, man, I think I got a problem. I, I think I got to switch to beer. Mm. And um, Brilliant. <laughs> and I did. And I got out yeah. of jail and I think I drank beer the first night. Yeah. And it was fine. Very civilized. And I think I drank beer the second night. No, no issues. No yeah. incidents. The third night I drank a beer and then I, ended up at the bar and had a shot of something. And I ended up that night in a Mel's diner and I cleared a whole table of food onto the floor and ended up in bare feet. And I was jumping into bushes and I was trying to fight people. And 
I, I woke up the next morning, like around 11 and believe it or not, I felt fine, but I couldn't remember. I'm like, what the heck? And my buddy had been sleeping on the couch comes in and he goes, dude, you're an alcoholic. And I was like, what? And he starts listing all these things I, I did and I could vaguely remember. And I said, Oh my God, I am. And, uh, I am. And, and it was almost this relief. Like there's a name for what I have. There's a name for what's wrong with me. And I, I remember I'd already actually been sentenced by the judge from the car accident to AA, but now I was kind of excited about it. And yeah. uh, so I went to my first meeting, I think a couple of days later, but there was that friend who actually I used to party with, but he was in AA now. And I was talking to him like the night before my first meeting. And I, like I said, I wanted to find out a, why was I so angry? B, um, you know, could I be comfortable in social situations without drinking? Yeah. That, that's all I wanted to know. Yeah. And he goes, don't worry. You're, you're going to figure that out. And I went to the meeting. It was the log cabin um, Sunday morning meeting. And there was like famous people and pretty girls and cool people. And I was like, okay, I think I can do this. And uh, I remember I, I got there and my friend who I, was going to meet me there ushers me in. And there was a little, um, there was one empty seat. This place was packed and there was one empty seat and it said commitment seat saver. And I go, oh, they committed a seat for me. This is so cool. And uh, he sits me down and, and this girl speaking from the podium. And instantly I was like, yeah, yeah, that's me. She's, mm. she's the same as me. Yeah. Everyone here is the same. These are my people. And it was this huge relief. I remember calling on my friends like, guess what? I'm an alcoholic. And they're all like, <laughs> oh, that's terrible. I'm like, no, no, it's great. You don't it's understand. Awesome. This is the best news I've ever got. And uh, But I remember after the meeting, there was people cleaning up. I think I volunteered to clean up some chairs. And there was people sponsoring people and all this list of the people with commitments. And I thought, so in addition to those first two things that I wanted to learn, whether I could be comfortable in social situations, whether I could um, – you know, uh, I wanted to find out if, if, if I could be useful, if I could somehow be useful in my life yeah, and that I would stick around long enough. I had no plans to necessarily do this for more than, you know, maybe a year, but if I could just figure out if there was some way I could become useful and, and figure out why I was so angry. Hmm. And, uh, I, I did all of those things, all of those yeah. things. Yeah. That's, um, you know, one, one of the, questions that that i get a lot is uh or comments kind of a mix of, of both probably is a lot of fear in going to their first meeting right someone's first meeting like what what do i expect so hard and obviously it's a little different right now because most of the clubhouses and meetings are closed down so everyone's having to adapt and kind of move over to this digital platform but even that i've got some emails and, and messages with that like if you if you were were, were talking to somebody new right now um, you know, who was, who was, you know, they, they know they got an issue. They want to get some help. Um, you know, they're, they've been thinking about, you know, jumping in a meeting. Like what, what would you tell them? Well, I mean, being scared is normal. I was mm. on the phone driving up to that first meeting with my buddy who told me I was an alcoholic. Uh, and I'm like, oh, I'm nervous about this. I don't even know where the place is. I'm looking around and I see this big crowd of people outside of this clubhouse I was like, oh man, I see it. And I mean, half of me wanted to just keep driving, drive home. Like I tried, you <laughs> yeah. know, chalk one up, tap, pat myself on the back. But uh, I said, okay, I got to go. I got to go find parking. I found, found parking. And I think like you said in your intro, like everything good in your life is the result of you just kind of moving forward, just kind of throwing yourself into it, diving in and, and that's been my experience too. So somehow, I don't know. And, and having my friend there who found me, welcomed me, I'll tell you, you're, you're never going to be as popular as, as, as you are ever again in your life at your first meeting. You know, my, my buddy's parading me <laughs> yeah. around. It's his first meeting. And they're like, oh my God, that's so amazing. I'm like, yeah, you know, it's no big deal. <laughs> <laughs> that's so funny, man. And I felt just yeah. great. I mean, I felt pretty cool. And I remember telling someone, yeah, it's like the first day of the rest of my life. And they're like, whoa, yeah. whoa, whoa, take it easy. I was like, okay, I'll take it easy. Yeah. You know? And all of that. So I learned, you know, there's things you can say, things you can't say. And, yeah. and, uh, but it was wonder wonderful. And you know what? It was funny. I didn't, I was a bit shy. So I didn't connect there at that 
first meeting. I mean, I, I met a couple of people. I met my first sponsor there. I met some great people, but it was really, um, eventually five years later, as a matter of fact, I don't want to discourage anyone. They don't have to wait as long as I did, but I was still in a lot of pain. I was still doing dumb stuff. And, yeah. and, uh, I, I had finally worked the steps, uh, partially at two years, again, at four years. Um, I'd gone to meetings, uh, maybe around year two where I was forced to share like a men's meeting where, where we went around in a circle. I think after that I got my first commitment, like proper regular commitment, but it wasn't until my whole life fell, fell apart around five years sober that I really dove in and I really got honest and, and was vulnerable uh, in these meetings. And that was the first time ever that anyone, that a guy ever asked me to sponsor him. Mm. And, and, and that kind of was a thing around, um, that five year mark where I had this surrender, I had this rock bottom that, that, that really in a way was almost more profound than the original rock bottom that brought me to AA in the first place. So that was really when Aloe House was born too. Um, and this whole community of friends and, and connections that I still have to this day, my, my wife, I really met her out of that community of friends, that, that fellowship that we had at that time. And that was me going around and finding a meeting where, where I found my people. I don't know how yeah. else to really put it, but don't just sort of settle for that first meeting. I mean, don't, it's kind of, I don't, I don't want to say it's like prison, you know, you don't talk to the first person you meet, but like observe, you know, yeah. go check out different meetings and it's okay if, if you need to move around a little bit until you find yeah. people kind of like you, maybe it's other young people, you know, and I know AA is, it's, it's very important that young people, find something that resonates with them and those meetings are there don't don't be discouraged if you don't find that in your first meeting yeah yeah we we had a great uh well i guess have had however you want to look at it hopefully it starts back up soon but uh the young uh young people's meeting on friday nights which which i had to question at first if i'm still considered young and i went and yeah. it turned out i wasn't you know nearly there was definitely some all different ages in there but that meeting was great man there was just tons of energy um, a lot of good people in there, all different ages, all different backgrounds. Uh, and I really, really enjoyed that one. I just, just remembered that as you were kind of saying that you got to find something that fits for you. You know what I mean? So look around a little bit. And I want to mention what you kind of, uh, touched on too. In like I said, in the intro, one of the things that I try to live by is those three words just show up. And you, you reminded me of that when, when you mentioned Allah house. So you're, you're do you're on this path, right? And you're you get in a car accident, and man, things start to change. And you go to this meeting, like you didn't have this plan. I'm gonna start, you know, one of the most successful treatment centers in the Los Angeles area, and it's gonna branch out and have multiple. Like that wasn't you, it wasn't your thought. You were just showing up. You were just trying to do the next right thing and stay sober and just try to do your next foot in front of you type of thing. And and I think that in too many cases we get caught trying to figure things out and trying to map out and plan and, and control. I think control is probably a good word that I know it is for me. Whereas when I do that, man, it's, it never works out. But when I just show up and when I just do the next right thing and try to be of service and do that, man, like God just does some work so many times, man. Like, it seems like you experienced that firsthand. A hundred percent. I mean, there was things I did when I was sober. That, and, and even if I look back, my whole life is this strange series of events. Um, but once I got sober, uh, these events became usually less dangerous or, or at least I was conscious of the risks, I guess. So one of the first things I did is I learned how to fly, I learned yeah. how to fly helicopters. Wow. That hadn't even <laughs> That's occurred crazy. to me, Yeah, you know, and yeah, running a rehab, like first originally it was a sober living, but I have no business doing that. Like that's insane. It never occurred to me. I didn't even know what a sober living house was like in Canada we have halfway houses. Yeah. And so around that five year mark where we were living in Malibu, uh, there was three of us. We were all, our lives were falling apart. One of us was getting divorced. Two of us had lost our, our whole life savings trying to make a movie that didn't end up working. Mm. And we were all like living on each other's couches and floors. And we started going to like two, three meetings a day. Cause that's all I knew. It was either we were going to drink and use yeah. and, you know, soothe our, stress and our pain that way or we were just going to jump into two three meetings a day 
And the meetings we would go to in the evenings were often in these sober living houses. And we'd look around at these beautiful houses and some of these like knuckleheads who were running them and we're like, like every good business starts. And I'm sure many yeah. of our staff have thought the exact same thing. Like we could do better than this. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, and that's what we thought. And so our first house, one of us had enough credit and a little money to lease this house. Okay. And we leased the house, but we lived in it. Oh, we ate wow. the food. We put the gas in our car, which I think I'd, uh, my car was from Canada. I think I'd stopped paying the lease. <laughs> I had like send it back with an apology, like, sorry for the last few payments, you know, but uh, we had nothing. We literally had nothing. And though I remember we had one client, so we had the house, we secured the house. We had one client. Um, she was in kind of this unsafe sober living. Her parents were cool. She moved into ours. We were going to open. Um, I'm lying in bed in the sober living house the night before we open. And I'm like, wait a second, what are we doing? I can't fill this house with clients. I can't, I, I, even if I did, I, living in a house with like addicts and alcoholics, like wow. that, that sounds terrible. I can't do that. Like, what am I doing? Oh my God, I've made a huge mistake. But it turned out to be the greatest joy and the greatest passion in my whole life. And it, it all clicked and everything made sense even my it's funny i mean you mentioned planning like my my master's degree was in planning and all i learned <laughs> is you can't plan anything it's so you incredible can't plan anything yeah what did jo john lennon said like life is what happens when you're busy making other plans that's good yeah, yeah. that's right so what so in that moment i want to back up just a little bit there because that's good you're laying in bed that night and all these thoughts start coming in how many of us out there you know i know i've experienced that. i'm sure a lot of people listening out there when you get in some situation for me it was going to going to uh, to rehab for the first time like i had done that late in bed and go man i've made a huge mistake the night before i was supposed to leave i got this i can do this on my own i don't need this you know all that stuff starts that enemy voices the committee up there whatever you call it starts creeping in um did you just go to sleep that night and wake up or did, how, how did that kind of or did you kind of were you able to kind of overcome that in some certain way just by surrendering it or what did that look like can you remember i, think I just fell asleep i'm a pretty good sleeper and i <laughs> Easy. I, yeah. I fall unconscious like my now I have two kids and you know work and at the end of the day I'm exhausted my wife yeah. and I climb into bed turn on a show I'm asleep in 10 minutes I, yeah. so that night I fell asleep I woke up you know and sleep is this great healer like we're all looking to kind of you know nothing against therapy and you know doing this personal work sure sometimes it's like go see a movie Just go to rest. sleep yeah you know, everything will be okay after. Yeah. And um, everything works itself out. The things I was worried about a year ago, I'd have to I'd have to go back. I mean, oh, well, our business had just burned down on the Woolsey fire. Ooh. Even that. Wow. We, uh, uh, I remember learning, I was driving to Orange County to, to reconnect with my family and on the phone, learning that our basically our entire business had burned down, um, pulled over, <laughs> basically curled up into the fetal position, gave up. I think I'd surrendered so many times by that, you know, I'm 13 years sober last year. And, and um, I think I, maybe I just turned 14, just turned 14 years sober a, a week before. Wow. And uh, I'd surrendered so many times that I'd almost was at peace with it. I'm like, okay, I'll take my kids out of dance class. I'll trade my Volvo in for a Honda. I've had a Honda. They're great cars and I'll be fine. Like yeah. I'll get through this. We'll figure it out. And, um, so that act of surrendering, I still have fear. I'm still gripped by fear, but I think I've become a little better at surrendering just by, mm. by sheer virtue of experiencing it, yeah. having to experience so many times. Cause really there's no other choice. You either fight it or you surrender and everything. It's like everything works itself out and we're just part of that. Um, that's been my experience. Yeah, no, that's good. And the surrender is, uh, it's such a tough thing sometimes, especially when we're in the moment going through something. Like I was on the phone with my sponsor um, last week and I was kind of going off a little bit about frustrated and I'm having some, dealing with some fear with all everything that's going on and just the world and in general right now, there's a lot going on. And I was kind of going off and he's, he's like kind of trying to like, yelling over the top of me a little bit, stop fighting, stop fighting. And I'm like, Oh man, damn it. You're he's always right. Right. Like, yeah, stop. Like, just take a step back. Let me just like give this thing up. Cause obviously I can't handle it. It's the same thing when I gave it up, you know, when I quit drinking in that process, that surrender was absolutely key 
um, you know, to, to moving forward. And once I was able to do that, then man, things started to, to, you know, change a little bit, but I wanted to ask you, so you said laying in bed, watching the show, getting some sleep, right? We're going to, uh, my, my wife and I have been on cheers lately, man, just going through the old, uh, there's something about that music, just the, the music. Mm. And, and I never, I never watched it when I was a kid, really. I didn't know that, um, that, uh, uh, he was sober in, in the show Ted too. Dawson, and he was, yeah. Just, yeah, Ted. Yeah. And it's such a great show, man. But I'm just kind of curious. What are you guys watching? You guys watching anything, uh, in particular? Well, what's funny. First of all, cheers. My business partner and I sing that song together all the time. Like one of us will just, we'll just be quiet. And then one of us will go like, you know, uh, making your way in the world today takes everything you, you got. got. And then he'll do the next. It's so good. And then yeah, actually great. we do a karaoke party every, um, Christmas and our song we do together. We're like heterosexual life partners, but we do the theme song to the greatest American hero. Oh, and if wow. you don't know that show, you need to work it out. This, the premise and it's the perfect metaphor for life is this goofy guy finds these, these aliens a touchdown. He has an alien encounter. They fly away. They drop this box, which contains this suit with like superpowers, like a superhero suit. Yeah. And he's like, oh my God. And he's had this encounter. He grabs the box and he walks away. And what he doesn't see is the instructions fall out on the ground. And he, and he goes home. <laughs> and all he's got is this suit. That's but it. he doesn't know how to land yeah. in particular. He can fly, but he can't land. Um, and he's learning how to live with these superpowers huh. without the instruction book. It's life. Yeah. And totally. the greatest American hero will sing that song. But uh uh, and old shows, I, I'm a little older. I'm like 45 now. I'm, and I grew up with Cheers. I grew up with yeah. Taxi. Oh, and I remember man. telling my wife, who's a little younger, I'm like, you got to watch the show Taxi. It, you know, it, it has Danny DeVito. It has, uh, you know, Tony Danza. It has Andy Kaufman. Like, really? the show is amazing. And I turn it on and watch for like a minute, five minutes. I'm like, oh, my God, this show is not that great. The sitcoms of today are just as good, if not better. Yeah. Have more clever writing. Like I was like, okay, anyway, forget that. Yeah. But we love, you know, we love Ozarks. Um, yeah, we started watching that. That's good, but it's dark, man. Like I, we did the, dark. we did the first season and I think we did most of the second one. And I woke up like this was, I think last week out yeah, and we, we went to bed together at nine and, and nine, 10 o'clock. And I wake up at like two and my wife's up watching it. And I'm like, what are you doing yeah. right now? But it's, yeah, that's a good one. You almost need a palate cleanser after. Oh, totally. Yeah, totally. You go watch like a comedy or something, but I, I like shows like that. Cause it's like, yep. man, at least I'm not Jason Bateman. Like man. I have troubles and I got my own problems, but yep. I'll take them any day over. He's that such a good, he's, he's such something. a good actor too, man. So I love his work. He, he does some great, great work for sure. He's yeah. so good. So what's what up? We, oh, go ahead. Yeah. Go ahead. Sorry. I'm trying to think of the shows. Like, honestly, I've never watched more than 10 minutes of almost any of them. Cause I fall asleep <laughs> drift into unconsciousness so easily. Yeah. Yeah. I watched uh man. What was it called now? It's uh, it's on Netflix and it's about, um, he was, he was a Russian mobster and these two Cuban guys and they sold, they, they, they were selling a Russian submarine to the Columbia cartels. Like in, uh, it's about an hour and a half and the dude's name is Tarzan. I can't remember the name of the show now, but it's a top Sounds pick good. on there. It's really good, man. Okay, yeah. They, they, they go through the whole, the whole scenario of how they came up and own, he owned this, this strip club, I think in, um, in Florida. And, and then they went through and they started selling like helicopters and then they got up to this Russian submarine and it's, yeah, it's pretty interesting I'll stuff. Check man. it out. Yeah. All kinds of crazy stuff. Yeah. Um, well, cool, man. What? Uh, so I, I kind of wanted to touch a little bit. Um, we just got a few minutes left, if that's good with you. Mm -hmm. um, what are people like? How are you seeing um, people dealing with what's going on right now? I mean, there's so many changes going on. Uh, you know, I've mentioned it a couple of times already. Meetings are closed down. People are having to kind of adjust and, and get into this digital life, which I don't myself personally love, but it, it's, it's something and it's, it's helping a lot of people. So I definitely appreciate it. Um, but what is it looking like down where you're at in the recovery community? Um, any, you know, any resources or anything you want to share or what are your thoughts on that? Yeah. I mean, it's tough right now. I mean, thank God for technology um, because at least there's something, you know, there's the AA yeah. meetings, there's, we offer a smart recovery meeting um, as well. 
uh, which probably you could find on the Smart Recovery website. But we do a lot of telehealth right now. A lot of our doctors and therapists, you know, are fair enough, don't want to or can't come in. Um, and then to their credit, others are. So yeah. obviously the line staff are there, my heroes. I mean, basically risking their health and well-being to help our clients because, sure. um, you know, of course, treatment is an essential medical service, uh, you know, with the number of people dying, um, you know, every year, 70,000. I wonder what the numbers are going to be like this this year. Yeah. And and everyone always forgets, too, there's like 88,000 uh, people die every year in America from alcohol-related deaths, too. Mm-hmm. Um, so we have these staff on the ground keeping keeping our clients safe and giving them the care that, that they need and deserve. Uh, and then a lot of the therapists can't help but but be there. I mean, obviously, everyone's wearing the masks and practicing the social distancing. And so far, and we've had some good luck. And I think California has been um, pretty good with the with the uh, self isolation and the social distancing so you know no no cases uh yet so That's good. um it's very good and it, it's tough though because you know for for a lot of businesses I, th- I think they're finding oh great well we can do we can work from home we can go online do more e-commerce or whatever but with addiction treatment and mental health treatment there's no there's no substituting the face-to-face oh, yeah. interaction I mean, it goes no. back to that Bill and Bob encounter. Like, Bill was calling around to find someone to go talk to, but he didn't talk to Dr. Bob on the phone. Once he talked to Dr. Bob's wife, he got his address and went over there. Yeah. And, you know, of course, famously, Dr. Bob says, I'll give him 15 minutes, <laughs> you know, and, and, yeah. and, Bill comes over and rather than kind of lecturing the guy and telling him, you know, what he needed to do differently or how he needed to change his life, he just shared his own story ended up they ended up hanging out for hours and hours and of course the rest is history so what we do at aloe house really um is try to kind of uh tap into that that initial like big bang of of aa which was that encounter between bill and bob which was this really cool mutual um sharing of 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 each other's stories with with each other in a non-condescending cool way and uh so we 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 have that we're never going to replace uh what what we do with with digital telephone skype yeah uh type stuff ever are you seeing uh you know because there's a lot of talk about with with the mental health um you know uh issues that are going on right now because of all this stress anxiety all types of stuff are you guys seeing any more um than usual people relapsing people going out. Cause I know there's been some conversation about that. It's kind of hard to tell, I think, but yeah, I mean, we, I I think the people who are with us are safe. Um, I know of people like in the recovery world who are having a really tough time right now. Yeah. Um, I mean, I, I, I I hate to say it, but I would imagine there's new addicts and alcoholics being created Mm -hmm. today, you know, because to me, um, addiction is, is caused by, you know, adverse experiences, usually in childhood, you know, so our job with our kids, our two kids here is to make them feel safe and, yeah. and cared for. And hopefully we, we then reduce, you know, um, any unnecessary stress with them. But, you know, stress, stresses can be added to later in one's life. I mean, you know, and traditionally we're looking at losing one's job or a divorce, uh, yeah. you know, these sort of later in life uh, traumatic events that can kind of lead to, you know, from some someone to f- social drinking to to more problematic drinking or drug using or anxiety pills or painkillers or things like that. So um, I think addiction is caused by that kind of stress, uh, obviously a- abuse and neglect as a, as as a child, but stress the stress caused by those things and by isolation. I mean, I'm someone who really believes in the sort of social causes of mental health problems. I think our whole culture is kind of warped and what's interesting for me looking at this whole experience with with the virus is that for a lot of people the kind of isolation that we're doing now to help prevent the virus from spreading doesn't look too different from where we were and what we were doing just a few months ago yeah we're very isolated people in our in our culture we we have our little family lives or we live alone and we go to work we come back we eat we watch something on a screen 
and we go to bed and we wake up and we do it all over again. And, uh, you know, I, I obviously have great sympathy for people who are uh, more stressed than, than usual and wondering, you know, where their food is going to come from or how they're going to pay their rent. Um, but isolation, I think, and the lack of community, the lack of connection was a huge uh, cause of addiction. I think, for example, if you go back to the 1700s in Britain, when you first saw the, the sort of um, insane asylums, you know, I guess is, is, is what they called them, but um, filling up with people and, and, and building more and more of these insane asylums to deal with what was becoming a, 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 a pandemic or, or an epidemic of uh, mental health crises yeah. due to the Industrial Revolution. You know, so I'm someone who who believes that the whole way we live together needs to change. And, and I really hope I don't know if it's overly uh, idealistic of me to say, but I really hope a lot of the things we're learning about the um, problems with the way we live together uh, can be addressed, you know, let alone global warming. But, um, you know, the fact that 40 percent of Americans don't have four hundred dollars to pay for some kind of unforeseen emergency health or otherwise um, that we aren't covered properly for for health care uh, and medicine and things like that. So I've seen a lot of good. I've seen people getting together, helping each other out, you know. And so I, I, I'm someone who's always believed that we can do this, but we it requires us kind of like us as recovering addicts, like uh, kind of changing everything. Yeah. Like nothing changes till uh, till everything changes right? yeah that's good that's good man are you uh, nothing changes if nothing changes so we have to change everything in other words are you are you open i don't know how old your kids are minor minor uh, uh five and nine almost six and ten pretty close together but um so they're old enough to to understand and know you know what i mean what i do for work and you know that i'm sober and um, do they, are you open, pretty open with your kids? I get that question sometimes too. Like, how do yeah. I tell my kids or whatever? I'm just kind of curious. Yeah. We broach it with them a little bit. The, the little one's just about to turn four. So she doesn't understand. Yeah. And then I think, uh, so my wife just had uh, nine years sober Nice. and, uh, she had a birthday and a birthday and someone sent her a card and flowers and our six almost seven year old asked what they were for and so you got to kind of yeah make the language more basic but mommy used to drink now she doesn't drink some people drink normally some people don't drink normally and um i think uh you know we so we we, we talk about it like that so she knows we're, we're both sober yeah you know it's, it's definitely a conversation it's gonna be an ongoing dialogue i think she asked me once if i'd been to jail i think I looked at my wife and then <laughs> luckily little kids get distracted pretty easily. And she was onto something else. And I was like, that's a tough one. Yeah. <laughs> but you know, both my wife and I, and I have been to jail. And, yeah. and so, uh, you know, we're, we're going to have that conversation with them too. And, um, you know, that there's certainly nothing to be ashamed of yeah. if we've had these lives. And in fact, I mean, my favorite people are people who've suffered from addiction, who, who are still suffering from addiction, uh, who, uh, you know, have been to jail who've kind of messed up their lives. So these are my people. I find them more yeah. interesting and have these sort of richer lives that we, we get each other. Uh, you know, some of us have been through those same kind of difficult childhoods. And so, you know, I, I think, and our little one, our, our, our older child, almost seven, I mean, she grew up in the sober living. She learned how to mm -hmm. crawl on the the floor and the sober living and we'd bring her to meetings and she'd be asleep. I mean, she grew up with this. So yeah. it's just a matter of time as they're able to kind of con conceptualize these things. Yeah. Uh, you know, we'll be able to describe more of it. Yeah. That's awesome, man. Congrats on your family. So I think that's great that your, that your wife is in recovery and that, um, you know, you brought your kids up in it and, and that kind of runs tenfold. I feel like as time goes on and you just continue to serve and then maybe your kids have an opportunity to do that. Maybe not, who knows, you know what I mean? But that option is always there to serve others and to con continue to help. Uh, I, I think it's in uh, Isaiah, those, those who have seen uh, a great uh, darkness have seen a great light at the same time. You just reminded me of that when I, I, cause I'm the same. I love talking to people who have been through some stuff because a lot of the times that's where, at least I'll speak for myself. 
That's where I finally found myself. That's where I finally found out who Shane Raymer actually is to some extent. And I still continue to do that every day, obviously, in this learning. This is a process. I'll never arrive. But um, I didn't know, man, for 32 years. I was just numb to it all, man. I was this broken down boy stuck in this man body that was just like, you know, like what the hell is going on? And it's just, uh, it's great to, to connect with other people who have been through and, and can understand. And I think that goes back to, uh, it's just coming to me right now that the, the, uh, the allo um, kind of way, right. It's about connection. I think, I, I think I read that on the website. Like it's, that's, that's a lot of what your focus is. And I think you just kind of mentioned that too, just about people and stuff. So that's great. And I want to let folks know if you want to find more info, go to allo and I'll make sure to put that in the, uh, in the uh, show notes so that you guys can go there and click on that. If you want to check anything out, um, Evan, before we wrap this up, I just want to give you uh, uh, one last opportunity. Do you have any words of advice, uh, anything for someone out there struggling, um, anything to maybe take away with before we, uh, before we wrap up the podcast today? Yeah. I mean, anyone who's struggling, there's got to be someone you can reach out to, you know, reach out to Shane on your social media. There's, um, you know, my friend Dave has the dopey podcast and has yeah. an, another up, Dave? kind of re- recovery <laughs> community online. Um, my wife has her podcast recovering from reality. So, I mean, if you want to meet other people and especially in these uh, times of uh, social isolation, you know, start with those, with those online communities. Um, But you know that, Hey, we're all in recovery. We're all here to help those who are new and who may still be struggling. If you need someone to call you, you know, just, just ask for help and we'll, we'll be on the phone with you. We'll work through, you know, what options you might have to, to get in somewhere to, get detox, get some time under your belt, you know, and uh, be supported through this. You're not alone. I think it's this kind of, uh, uh, again, this culture that we live in that, that creates this illusion that, that we're alone. And those of us in recovery have really woken up to the fact that like we were never alone. We were never meant to be alone. Um, imagining we are alone is, is so harmful and yeah. sad and it's unnecessary. And that uh, you feel kind of weak and powerless right now, but the truth is like walk through that door that may be just open for you right now. So it might close again for a minute. So walk, walk through it now if you can and find out on the other side that like you're able to tap into a great sense of power through the community of others, through feeling like you're meant for something great. I mean, I have a theory that like addicts and alcoholics are actually the ones meant to lead us out of this troubled world that we're in to show by example that the supposedly the, the lowest amongst us and the sickest amongst us are actually meant to be the kind of way showers to lead us all, you know, and it's true. I'll tell you, and I learned it during the fires. I'm learning it now again, that those of us in recovery and those suffering from addiction, like we thrive in chaos. Like this is our element. Yeah. Hunter S Thompson said, you know, when the going gets weird, the weird turn pro that's <laughs> like us. That. That's us. Yeah, that's us. Like, good this is our time and the whole world in all its confusion needs, needs you for, for those who are struggling needs you to walk through that door, reach out your hand, join us. And uh, let's show the rest of the planet how this is done and how we can care for each other, how we can care for the world, how we can be conscientious of, you know, the kind of garbage we produce and make something good and make something worthwhile and realize that life is about relationships and about connection. And it's not about all this stuff you see on TV and social media. Um, So just, I would just want to encourage people like you, you, you have more power than you know, and, and, and it gets better. Um, Just walk through that door, reach out your hand, connect with somebody who you know is sober and they're going to help you and they're hopefully, you know, going to be kind and patient with you and, and uh, like people were with me. And that's my obligation now is to be kind and patient with others. Yeah. Good stuff. Evan, thanks so much for coming on the podcast today, man. I appreciate you. Uh, Go to allorecovery.com folks. If you want to check out more Uh, man, thank you again. I appreciate you coming on. Thank you, Shane. I appreciate you having me very much. All right, you can check us out at thatsoberguy.com. Connect with us on Instagram, at Real That Sober Guy, on Twitter, at Shane Raymer. Uh, once again, thanks to Evan. Uh, thanks to Allo House. Thanks to Promises. Uh, let's see, what else we got here? I just, um, 
one last thing here. ZoomAAMeetings.com. Make sure you check that out if you need a meeting. 6 p.m. Pacific, 9 p.m. Eastern. Uh, I love you guys. Thanks for tuning in today. If it's your first time listening, keep coming back. Lots of resources out there as well. Peace, love, and respect, and keep your blood clean. With